This is the first video for section 3.6 on an introduction to cryptography. In this lecture, I'll be talking about substitution ciphers. So we want to protect the security of the messages that we send. And this is really important in our information age. Just think about the number of times that you send information that you hope is secure. A text message to a friend, Snapchat, online shopping. These are things where you're sending information and you're, you want to be pretty confident that the wrong person is not receiving that information. So how do we do that? Well, it's really not an option to prevent messages from being intercepted. We're sending signals through the air, through cell towers, through space, and it's really just not an option to say that there would be some way to prevent somebody else from picking up the message. So instead, what we have to do is disguise the message so that even if somebody does intercept our message, they won't be able to read it. And this process of disguising our message is called encryption. Not only do we want to disguise our messages, though, we want to disguise them in a way where the person we're sending the message to can understand what the message means. We don't want anybody else to understand the message, but we do want the person we're sending the message to to be able to understand it. So what this means is that we and the person we're sending the message to have to agree on some kind of secret system so that we can use that system to disguise our message, and then the person we're sending the message to can use that system to undisguise the message. And many of these systems are based on some kind of keyword or phrase that's only known to a select few, or a password, something like that. So a little bit of terminology here. Cryptography is the study of processes by which information is disguised so that unintended recipients cannot understand it. Okay, so we've got information, we're disguising it, and then unintended recipients. That means people we don't want to receive our message, right? They've intercepted our message, we didn't want that to happen. So if it does happen, we want to make sure that they can't understand it. Now, a cipher is a specific rule, and it needs to be a reversible rule. So we want to be able to disguise our message, but we want the person who's receiving the message, the intended recipient, to be able to undisguise it. So a cipher is not the, just the sort of blanket term that's used for these kinds of rules. And there's many different kinds of ciphers, and we're going to learn about a few in this section. So rather than disguising and undisguising, we use these fancy words encryption and decryption. So encryption just means disguising the message. Decryption is the undisguising, the reverse of the process. And this word reverse is really important, right? Whenever we come up with our process, the decryption is going to be important. We want to make sure that not only are we successfully disguising our message, but that this process can be undone. So we want to make sure that we're using a cipher that's simple enough to use regularly, but complicated enough so that the messages cannot be easily undisguised by somebody who doesn't know the rule. So it's a tricky thing. We don't want it to be too difficult to disguise our message and undisguise our message, but we want it to be complicated enough so that somebody who's sneakily intercepting our messages can't still figure out what the message says. So one of the simplest ciphers and one of the oldest ciphers is called the Caesar cipher. And this is named after Roman Emperor Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar used this to communicate with his general. So this is a real historical uh, encryption method. The rule for the Caesar cipher is relatively simple. What we do is we take every letter of our original message. So these will be the letters here in our original message. And we want to replace those letters by letters that are three spaces further along in the alphabet. So A gets replaced by D, B gets replaced by E, C gets replaced by F, and so on. So this is our encrypted, or in other words, disguised message. So these will be the letters that we'll send to the person we're trying to send our message to. What happens when we get to the end of the alphabet, right? What about X, Y, and Z? We can't go three spaces forward in the alphabet there. So instead of what we do is we loop around to the beginning of the alphabet. So that every letter in our alphabet, every one of these 26 letters, can appear in the original message, and then there's a corresponding letter in the disguised message, in the encrypted message. Okay, let's do an example. So let's encode the message attack at daybreak using our Caesar cipher. So I'm going to write out the letters of this message, and I'm just going to use all caps just to make it a little easier. We'll talk about punctuation and capitalization and stuff in a future slide. So I'm writing everything out here. And now also what I like to do is I like to actually write out the alphabet off to the side here to make it a little bit easier for me to visually see what three spaces forward in the alphabet looks like. So I'm just going to write the alphabet here. All right. So now we're just going to go one letter at a time through our message and look at our alphabet and go three spaces forward, and that will be the letter in our encrypted message. So from A, three spaces forward from A, is going to be D. 
So in my encrypted message, the A gets replaced by a D. Next up, I've got a T. So T is going to get replaced by 1, 2, 3. It's going to get replaced by W. Now I've got another T. So what does that get replaced by? Well, it gets replaced by the same thing. It's the same rule for each letter. So once I know that T gets replaced by W, all of the T's in my message are going to get replaced by W's, even this T that occurs a little bit later on in my message. Similarly, I know that A gets replaced by D, so all of these A's are going to get replaced by D's. So that can save me a little bit of time rather than having to go every letter one at a time. C, if I look over at my alphabet, C is going to get replaced by F. There are no other C's in my message, so that doesn't save me anything, but if there had been, then they would all get replaced by F's. K in my message, one, two, three, K gets replaced by N, and there's another K over here, so that's also going to get replaced by N. I've got a D here. Now, this is a D in my original message, right? That's an original message D as compared to the encrypted message Ds that I have down here. So what happens to D? D is going to get replaced by 1, 2, 3. D is going to get replaced by G. Y, now because Y is toward the end of the alphabet, we've got to be a little bit careful. One space forward from Y gets me to Z. A second space forward from Z gets me to A. And a third space forward gets me to B. So Y is going to get replaced by B. B gets replaced by E. R is going to get replaced by U. And E will get replaced by H. So that's our encrypted message. So this whole thing here, this is what we send to our general out in the field. And as we can see, it looks like nonsense, right? There's no easy way to look at that and understand what the original message was supposed to be. But now once our general receives this message, that general can recover the original message simply by reversing this process, just counting three letters backwards in the alphabet. So the general receives the letter D and goes three spaces back and is able to understand that that's an A. They start with a W and goes three spaces back and understand that that's a T and so on. And so eventually they would be able to get back the original message. So that's how this process works. So this is what we sent. This is what was received. But if it wasn't our general who knows the rule and some enemy general, for example, or enemy soldier received that message, it would just look like nonsense. But then this is the decoded or decrypted message that our general can understand. Now, we're typically going to emit spaces and punctuation when we encode messages because those can just be clues to our enemy of what those things might look like, right? If we have, you know, a certain letter word and it's got an apostrophe, there's only so many words in our language that have apostrophes, and so they might be able to figure out part or all of our message. And even knowing the lengths of the words in our message can give the enemy a clue to contents of our message. In fact, there are actually puzzles that you see sometimes in the newspaper where it's a similar method to what we're talking about here, and they leave in the spaces in the punctuation, and the puzzle is to try to still figure out what the message is. And with enough clues like that, you can do it. Once we take out all those spaces of punctuation, though, the message becomes a big, long stream of letters, which can be a little bit unreadable. So typically what we'll do is we'll split the message into blocks of equal length. It doesn't really matter how long the blocks are, but it just helps to separate the message into pieces so that as you're encoding or decoding the message, you can do it at one chunk at a time. And when we're decoding our message, we can put the spaces and the punctuation back in based on our knowledge of the language, right? It's usually not too hard to look at a message where the spaces and punctuation have been taken out and still be able to read it. So here's another example. So this is a message that we've received. So this is an encoded message using the Caesar cipher, and we'd like to decode the message. So again, to help us with that, I'm going to write out the alphabet. I find it helpful to have this visual representation. All right, so our first letter in our message is D, and so if we want to decode that, we're going to walk three spaces backwards in our alphabet, right? That's the reverse process, and that's going to give us an A. And then we've got an O. If we go three spaces backwards from O, one, two, three, that's going to give us L. The next letter is O, so that's also going to be L. And in fact, again, we can do the same thing that we did with the previous example. All of the Ds in this message are going to decode as As, so we can just go ahead and do that. 
And all of the O's in this message are going to decode as L's. So we can do that as well. Next up, we've got a Z. If we go three spaces backwards in our alphabet from Z, that's going to be a W. Scanning real quick, I don't see any other Z's, so we'll just leave it at that. We've got an R. If we go three spaces backwards from R in our alphabet, I get an O. I've got a couple other R's here. There's an O, and there's an R, which is going to turn into an O. So we're starting to, to see some things. We're starting to see some words that make sense, right? We see the word all here. That seems uh, pretty good. And then we've got a U, three spaces backwards from that, gives us R. I don't see any other U's. All right, we've got an N, three, spe spe three spaces backwards from N is going to give us a K. Three spaces backwards from U is going to give us an N. There's, so there's another N there. G, three spaces back from that, is going to give us a D. Three spaces backwards from S is going to give us a P. B, we got to be careful here. B is towards the front of our alphabet. So when we go three spaces backwards, one, two, three, sorry, one to A, two gets us to Z, a third space gets us to Y. Again, we, like I said, we have to be careful there. So that's going to give us a Y here for our B. P, three spaces backwards from P, is going to give us M. N, we already did that. That gives us a K. H, three spaces backwards from H, is going to give us E. V, three spaces back, is going to give us S. M, three spaces back from M, is going to give us J. F, three spaces backwards from S. Uh, F is going to be C. N, we already did that. That's going to give us a K. G, we already did that, I think. Yep, that gives us a D. X, we haven't done that yet. That's going to give us U. Almost done. E, three spaces backwards from E, is going to give us B. And B, we already did that one. That's going to give us a Y. So this is our decoded message. And again, we have these spaces that we stuck in, right? Those were just to split the message into blocks. So those aren't actual English spaces that belong in between words. What we have to do now is smoosh all the letters together and understand where the real spaces in our message are. So we can see the word all, so we think that's going to be a space. Then we see the word work, and no play makes Jack a dull boy. And that's our message. So a substitution cipher is a cipher where each letter of the alphabet is replaced by another letter according to a consistent rule. So what we've been talking about, the Caesar cipher, is just one example of a substitution cipher. And when we say consistent here, a consistent rule means that the replacement rule is the same. So if in a different substitution cipher we decided that E was replaced by Q, for example, then all of the E's in our message are replaced by Q's. And we've been sort of using that both in the encoding process and the decoding process to make it a little bit faster. Now a shift cipher is a substitution cipher where the, the encoding rule involves moving forward or backward a certain number of spaces in the alphabet. And the Caesar cipher is also an example of that. It's also an example of a shift cipher. We're moving three spaces forward in the alphabet to encode our messages. Another example is the rote 13 cipher, where the encoding rule is to shift 13 spaces forward in the alphabet. That's another fairly well-known cipher. Now, the consistency of the substitution ciphers makes them easy to use, but it also makes them easier to break if the message is long enough. We can do something called frequency analysis to break substitution ciphers, because English is not just a random language. English has patterns. For example, the most common letters in the English language are E, A, and T. And this chart here sort of shows you the relative frequency of letters in the English language. So if we had a message that was long enough and that we knew or suspected had been encoded using a substitution cipher, we could look and say something like, oh, well, this message that we got has a whole bunch of R's in it. Right, But R isn't nearly as common of a letter as E or A or T is, so let's try replacing all the R's with E's, and let's try replacing one of the other really common letters with maybe A or T, and you might start getting little pieces of words. Right? Again, think about the example that we did before, where as we were decoding that message, we started seeing some words pop up even though we weren't done decoding the message. We saw the word all really early on in our decoding message, and so that might be a clue that could help you decode other parts of your message. So it's a little bit of trial and error, but it is possible to decode these messages 
using these, this frequency analysis. So next time we're going to try to find a way to not have so much consistency. Consistency is a major weakness of substitution ciphers, so we're going to look for a method that doesn't have that problem. But again, we still need to have some kind of rule that the message recipient can follow to decode the message. So we need to have a rule. We don't want it to be too complicated, but we also don't want it to be too simple.